sit. Sit down, slash sit, slash sit, enter. Why are you standing? I'm not pressing anything to make you stand up. Sit down, forward, slash sit. How is this difficult? Why do you keep standing up? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Strife Hayes, and this is Worst MMO Ever, a series where I play the worst MMOs I can find so you don't have to. Drop a like on the video or sub to the channel for more MMO stuff. Ring the bell for all the future notifications. And as usual, a huge thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel going. More on how you can support at the end. For now, Let's begin. Today we are playing Villagers and Heroes, a free MMO available on both PC and mobile. I'll be playing the PC version and judging it as if it were a full PC game because as we'll see later, the cash shop certainly has PC prices. Now stick with me here because we're going to see later that this game understands what it means to be an MMO only on the surface and once you dig a little deeper you'll discover it's the most formulaic paint by numbers approach to making an MMO you could ever hope to find. Steam Charts put the highest ever player count at 2,898 with a recent count of 19 which is a player drop from highest to lowest of around 99.4%. First off, the loading splash screen has the close button in the top right, but it's got a little wooden edging flourish around it, and I like this. It reminds me of those late 90s, early 2000s PC games that tried to visually match the UI to the feeling of the game. Character creation and, oh, this is nice. It's voiced like a storybook, although I do seem to be playing the human version of Shrek. So character creation is done in a story-like way. You turn the pages of a book, selecting your class, your starting zone, your abilities, and the voiceover fills in the story as you go, and this generates your starting profile, which is actually a really nice fantasy way of doing it. Now the hero part of the title is your traditional MMO adventure, while the villager aspect is growing a little homestead so we get to choose a house. I go with Spooky Mansion, because there's a small chance some of you are probably watching this at Halloween and you'll think I've been clever. The game starts and the tutorial is voiced, and voiced quite nicely in fact. It really wasn't my doing. I can assure you that I am an experienced driver and had nothing at all to do with our carriage just breaking down. You believe me, don't you? So the first quest is voiced too, it's a strong start. We get movement instructions, some quick controls, and then I need to catch a minnow. I also open the menu to rebind some keys, and rebinding keys is fine. It's not bad so far. The graphics are actually quite nice. They are stylized and chunky and quaint, and the ambient light rays from above are actually quite nice. And now for combat. Behold. Click on an enemy to select. Right click to attack, or use an ability from the combat bar. Oh! Okay, so few issues. As I played this game, I came to realize something. Villagers and Heroes is a game made by someone who understands the mechanical systems involved with an MMO, but doesn't understand what to actually do with them. It feels like someone has made a paint by numbers MMO. Everything is technically there without the understanding or the passion or the reasoning behind it being there. I'll explain as we go on. Combat is basically right click to attack, use abilities. Super simple stuff. Oh, a pop-up to pay real money to buy an upgrade pack to my class. How about you let me play the game for more than five minutes before trying to sell me some microtransactions, okay? The next fight sees us take on three cultists and they attack one at a time because that's Hollywood rules and the voice acting, while being decent, is not balanced at all. The actors are good, the guy they hired to balance audio in this game is not because the sound effects are way louder than they should be. The Dark Tyrant will rise again! This is an issue we'll bump into multiple times. I click on this mount icon and the cash shop pops up and oh trust me, we will come back to this later. And now a mini boss fight, which isn't bad. There are some mechanics and you have to dodge the red. My issue isn't with the programming of the fight, that seems to be solid. It's with the emotional feel. It feels empty. It feels hollow. It feels like nothing important is happening right now. Graphically it looks nice and ambient music fits, but it feels soulless and this is something we'll come back to again and again and again as I work out how to explain it better throughout this video. Turns out that was an evil dude, but it wasn't really him. It was a projection of him made by some cultists and now we're off to our own little township. Quick note about the camera, it's odd. And there's something wrong. It's bumpy. 
I don't know how or why, but it's not smooth. There are subtle leaps and bumps while moving, and I will figure out what this is later. Finish the first quest, and we get treated to another bit of unbalanced audio. Then stay here in Summer's Hollow and see what you can find out. Now, in most MMOs, the quest line or the main story quest somehow involves you directly, but the quest lines in Villagers and Heroes are somewhat nonsensical. There's an evil lord returning, a bunch of cultists are involved, some sociopathic actress is demanding everyone's attention, and this dude with horses and a strange voice. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. Not crazy. Ah uh, yes, I can see this is going to be full of lol random humour, isn't it? Quirky for the sake of being quirky, to cover up the fact that everything's only skin deep. And oh, when you level up you get a round of applause. Probably because the developers are genuinely impressed anyone stuck around long enough to level up. Leveling up gets you talent points, and you spend these in various talent trees, and there's also a reset prestige system. Once you've maxed out, you can return to level 1, which resets all the quests and levels, but grants you 5 bonus permanent talent points. So by leveling, resetting, and leveling again, you can become super powerful. Now, from what I read, prestiging doesn't change anything about the gameplay. It just resets it. So it's a way of essentially adding infinite content, provided you want to do the same things forever. The arrows on the floor are a nice touch, though. They are your tracked quests. The yellow arrows are side quest, the main storyline is purple, and they get bigger as you get closer to the destination. It's a nice optional navigational touch. This quest sees us getting an autograph from this insufferable actress, voiced by someone who has absolutely nailed the insufferable actress persona. Darling, how do you do? I always make a point to mingle with the commoners before a show. It lends such an air of gravitas to my performances, to be among the filthy and the vulgar, and to hear of their struggles. After getting the autograph, we insult her and she explodes. As an actor, I can confirm this happens. If you damage a performer's ego even slightly, they will blow up. Now this is the main plot of the early game. Investigate this whole exploding actress thing. This local guard saw me ask for an autograph, then he saw the actress explode, so of course he decides I am the ideal person to investigate this matter and gives me the authority to go wherever I want. Okay, I understand this game is fantasy, but look at the size of this backstage area. I was a theatre actor for years. There is no theatre in the world with this much unused backstage space. Now, in real life, I go and grab some lunch, and the game logs me out after 30 minutes of inactivity, so when I come back, I see two buttons. Log into the world, or raids. Ooh, interesting, a dedicated raiding area. I'll try this later. I like raids. Oh, I've figured out the camera issue as well. The camera has a gentle soft lock to lock behind the character, so whenever you're almost directly behind, but not quite, it adds a little bit of drag force to try and correct itself, but this drag force is added even if you're moving the camera at the time, so manually moving the camera doesn't actually give you full control. It's mostly full control with added in-game corrections, which just ends up feeling bumpy. I push on through this riveting plot and find an occult note in this chest, but this quest is happening in the overworld, and the overworld is shared with other players, and there's another player killing all the mobs I should have been fighting. Combat is... well, that's just it. It is. It is in the game. This game has combat. That's what you can say. It's not good. There's no thrilling music or animations or abilities or interrupting or tactics. It's not bad. It's not glitching or unresponsive. It just is. I don't feel like I'm in combat. I feel like I'm just here, and the enemy's just here. So far, Villagers and Heroes feels like an incredibly mediocre game. Like, this is the game version of absolutely average. The evil Shadow Dude appears outside again and demands we release someone called Tarquin from prison. Chat to some more NPCs, and it seems that this is the plot. The play, the actress, the ghost dude, this is the main story now. Oh, and that ghost that appeared? He's called the Malicious Miscreant, which sounds like a Saturday morning Scooby-Doo villain. And the good Scooby-Doo from the 90s, not whatever this is. The next map is actually quite nice, at least visually. The sight lines are great, the render distance is decent, the colour palette is spectacular, it is vibrant, it pops, and that's one thing Villagers and Heroes does pretty well. Graphically, the ambience in the areas is decent. As for the graphical style, it feels like child-friendly Warcraft. If Warcraft was Lego, this is Playmobil. 
Pryan is a crazy cat lady who talks to grapes and needs us to kill six bog frogs, so we set off to do that, which unfortunately means more combat. Okay, here's something I'll come back to later with the gathering and the crafting, but combat in this game is just so mechanically dull. But it's not bad enough to be entertaining in an ironic way. It's not the room levels of bad, it's just going through the motions. It's like looking out the window in the morning and seeing the sky is kinda grey but it's not cold. This is the combat system version of a slightly cloudy Thursday. Great Lady tells us the actress Understudy bought some poison stuff from a dude so it's likely the Understudy wanted to kill the main actress to take her part so we set off to talk to a poison seller who happens to live on Hayes Farm. The greatest farm in all the land. He won't help us until we kill some boars. Dude, you literally sell poison. Surely you could just poison whatever you need killed, but okay. Poison Seller tells us the understudy bought some poison and then asked about a book on summoning some evil stuff. A book written by a prisoner called Tarquin. The Poison Seller sent the understudy to the bookseller, so we follow the trail and the bookseller needs some spiders killed before they will help us. This entire game is just one small favour. The spiders lead us to this creepy house and a cultist cave inside. We find a peg leg. We then confront the understudy about this and the voice actor they've got for her is actually quite good. Death? Can this be? I, I, Calypso, bid you farewell. Oh. Most of the early game seems to just be running backward and forth, and the walking animation is fine. The controls are fine. The whole experience is a blanket of... Meh. I unlock a travel pad. These are basic teleporters for quick travel. I check out the world map and yep, it's actually pretty big. I'm hoping it's full of varied and intriguing content and not just copy-paste systems of the same combat but with higher numbers. We continue the adventure onwards and hunt down the book and on the way we meet Simon Miller. No ball jokes. Not one, hear me? The general ambience of the areas is above par, mostly due to the colour palette. The models aren't bad, the music, well, we'll talk about that later. But visually, it's not awful. I mean, look, this Valley of Oblivion is great. Purples and deep blues and blacks. It looks nice. Not particularly memorable, but it looks nice. And if you're thinking, hey, have they balanced the audio levels yet? No. No, they have not. Ugh. So these dudes are called the Ice Watch and they keep these torches from being lit because if they ever are lit, the Dark Lord returns. Cool law. You'd think maybe just, I don't know, destroy the torches, but hey, you know what you're doing. They send me to dig up some dirt. On the way, I kill a bounty boss. Now, bounty bosses respawn daily and give increased experience and good possible item rewards. They are no different mechanically to any other enemy, except they have more health. Are you starting to see what I mean when I say this game is mechanically fine but emotionally vapid? Like the developer knew, ooh, we should put some daily bosses in. But they didn't know what the daily bosses had to be, so they just put regular enemies with more health. In the dirt we find the actress's engagement ring and we take this to a specialist on gemstones so they can read the aura around the ring. And on the way, I bump into... me. One of you, someone from the Discord who saw that I was playing this game, downloaded it, started a character, and started asking questions in town pretending to be me. I knew this would happen eventually, but to do this you had to download and play the game, so there are no real winners here. Here's an irrelevant but really annoying touch. The experience bar at the bottom is divided into smaller sections. That's fine, most games do that. Now, how many sections do you think there are? Well, there's eight on the left, so you'd assume there'd be eight on the right. Sixteen little sections, but no. There are eight on the left and seven on the right. The XP bar is not evenly balanced. It's just got 15 sections. This irritates me way more than it should. Just make it 16. Halving things four times makes 16 sections. Why is it 15 sections? We finally meet the dude who can read gemstones and his model is terrifying. This is Aemon, clearly some sort of nightmare creature. The model does have arms, but they clip into his gigantic stomach, creating this absolute monstrosity. He needs us to collect some food before he reads the gem's aura. Oh, whenever you complete a quest objective, no matter how small the objective is, the game plays this really loud, obnoxious pencil scribbling sound. If you play this game, you best get used to hearing that every few minutes. Eamon says the ring's aura is bad, the actress's marriage was a sham and her husband hated her. Well, I mean, yeah, we've met her, we don't need a seer to tell us that. Back in town there's even more drama, people are disappearing but no one knows why. So we investigate further, because apparently we are the only saviour this town has. I wonder how popular the mobile version of this game is, because if this released on PC it would almost immediately be forgotten. 
Well, Google rates it as 4.3, meaning this game is as highly rated as Gardenscapes. Off to the docks now. Nice little garden assets of growing stuff and more fetch quests. Talk to such and such, go and hand in to so and so, and now we're off to kill some rats. One of the rats drops a lockbox, and oh right, it's a premium lockbox that requires a premium key bought for real money. Well, this is a good time to look at the cash shop then. The cash shop in Villagers and Heroes is extensive. You can buy everything from costumes to pets to mounts to straight up skilling boosts, and the skilling system we will explore later. But here's what catches my eye in the cash shop. You can buy a dragon mount for 600 coins. But just like every other scummy cash shop, the coin packs are sold in awkward sizes that don't relate to what you actually need to pay for the things that you want. So you can buy 350 or a thousand. And a thousand coins is going to cost you 36 pounds. That's fifty dollars. A key for the lockbox will cost you six coins, by the way, sold in awkwardly sized packs again, so you're always just above or just below what you think you should be buying. As for mechanical advantages, well, yeah, you can buy a pair of boots that doubles your jump height. Can't remember any other game that straight up sells you a better jump in the cash shop, but there you are. There's also a monthly sub club called the Ardent Society for $10 a month. You can get cheaper prices in the shop if you're a paying sub. What a great deal. But it's this pack that really annoys me. The most expensive pack I can find, the Brood of Dragons pack. It contains four dragon mounts and four dragon pets for 1,950 coins. Do you want to see the four different mounts and four different pets you get? Here you go. Palette swaps. Literal palette swaps of one mount model and one pet model, but in four different colours. All for the low, low price of just over $90. You know what, maybe it's time to try the raids from the main menu. So I log out and I try and go to raiding. We're greeted with a long, ominous text intro, explaining how heroes have ventured into an endless pyramid-style dungeon and never return. So now it's our turn, and isn't that basically just the plot to Death Trap Dungeon? So I excitedly click go in and no. Raids are for level 20 players and over. No raids for you, get back to grinding and maybe consider buying the $90 dragon pack. You know what, forget the main quest, let's go and craft stuff because everyone tells me the crafting in this game is pretty good. So I talked to some crafting tutors and they set me off on a quest to go and talk to all the other crafting tutors and go and do some small tasks for them. This is basically a load of walking from one teacher to the other and then being given materials and interacting with crafting stations to make stuff. And here's my issue with crafting. The game has gathering professions like woodcutting and mining and fishing, but they're all mechanically exactly the same. And the making professions like blacksmithing or wood turning or cooking are also exactly the same, but they are also heavily monetized. Like here, the interface is mechanically solid. It's laid out fine, you can see the items and recipes on the left, you can see what you can make in the middle, and you click to make it on the right. This makes sense. But you'll notice you can increase the amount of items you are making per crafting attempt. Now, each crafting attempt only takes a second or two, regardless of how many you're making. So if you make loads of items because you've got loads of resources, you'll gain loads of experience in one go. So it's super efficient to do this. But making more than the base minimum needs resources called Motes of Yorick. And you'll get given some for free, but when you've used them, you need to buy them in the cash shop. It's a premium item used to vastly speed up crafting, and you will need hundreds of them. So I craft some wood into some better wood and then into an axe, and in the traditional MMO crafting style, it is way worse than the axe I got from a level 1 enemy drop. Then I go to do some cooking and hang on. This music. I know this music. This was in Secondhand Lands, another game I've played but tried to block from memory. Just listen. You will know this music too. I downloaded Shazam just to find this bit of music. It's called The Builder by Kevin MacLeod. This dude makes a load of generic video game background music. 
If you're a small independent studio making a game, you can license this guy's music out. But it seems, even though Villagers and Heroes are selling $90 palette swapped packs, they are still using generic background music. I checked the other areas in the game and yep, it's basically all this guy's stuff. Now I'm sure I'll get people in the comments saying, Josh, that's what the music is designed for. If you're making a small game, you're meant to be able to license out someone else's music. And yes, that's true. But an MMORPG is not a small game. I make some food. Remember, crafting time is the same no matter how much you're making, so moats of Yorick are basically a pay-for-win crafting boost. On my way to the next station, I kill Shrook the Sheep, who was a bounty enemy. Whoever put a bounty on a sheep, you can sleep safely once again. One thing I do notice doing these crafting quests, your inventory fills up with crafting materials super quickly, like each profession spams you with stuff. And you have two bags as standard, and then you need to buy the rest. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this system is designed to make you buy bags, not actually be the best it could be. It's 50 premium coins per bag, by the way. I need to make some food using peas to finish a quest, but I accidentally used up all the peas just messing around with the system and the trainer won't give me any more. So before I finish, I need to find a way to grow peas. Also, I need some wood, so let's go and get some. I find a tree and begin to chop it down. With my sickle. Why? Why are you using a sickle to chop a tree? That NPC is using an axe. I'm a shaman. I have an axe as a weapon. Just use the axe. Move areas to go and catch some fish and pick some apples. Loading screens are adverts for the cash shop, by the way. Unless they aren't, in which case they're adverts for raid bosses you can't kill. Fishing is click on an area and then fish just appear. Just how woodcutting was click on a tree and then wood just appears. And picking apples is click on a tree and then apples appear. Look, I know this system is designed to be interactive for mobile users to click on stuff. But you know what happens if you don't click the resources that appear? They go into your inventory. Anyway, you've just put interactive clicking in with no actual gameplay mechanic behind it. There's no downside if you don't do this. There's no advantage if you do. And when I start mining, I realise why I hate this so much. Woodcutting, fishing, apple picking, mining, all the gathering professions are palette swapped versions of the other. Click resource giver, wait. They aren't different or unique in any way. Now let's compare this to say RuneScape, a game with lots of gathering. Mining in RuneScape gives one resource per click, then you must find a new resource. Woodcutting gives multiple resources per click, but then must be moved on from. Fishing gives multiple, provided you have a third party resource like bait or feathers. Farming gives various yields based on how much compost you have used. Small, subtle, mechanical differences that make the gathering professions feel different from each other. And the crafting screen is the same for every profession. Use resource A to make resource B, then combine B and C to make D. Look, this is definitely a crafting system, but it is the most basic, simplistic, uninspired system you could possibly have. You've got four or five gathering professions which are all carbon copies of each other with different named resources. And then several crafting professions which again are identical. The crafting system isn't deep, it's just copy pasted five times. It's not bad, it's not good, it just is. If this game were a spice, it would be flour. When people tell me they're making an MMORPG and it's going to have gathering and crafting, this is what they mean. This is what they think is good, and it's not. It's an incredibly safe, simple system. It doesn't engage, it doesn't offend, it doesn't innovate, it doesn't confuse. It is a crafting system. It just is. Villagers and Heroes is the MMO version of a film you know you've seen but can't remember because it did nothing either well enough or bad enough to be memorable. It's like the second album from a band you like. It's not bad, it's just not good. The adventure, if you can call it that, continues and we talk to the Bugmaster, whose actual in-game title is Master Bugger. No, there's no joke there, that's too easy. Mildren needs bugs. We collect bugs the same way we collect absolutely everything else. Click the object and wait for the items to appear. Then we get sent into the caverns. Oh, I've got it. I've got the perfect feeling of playing this game. Years ago, a friend told me the band Wheatus were playing at a nearby bar. Now, Wheatus are famous for one song, Teenage Dirtbag, so we went along. I mean, I'm not a massive Wheatus fan. I don't know if there are any massive Wheatus fans, but everyone liked that song. It's probably going to be a good time. The bar was pretty full, people were having a good time, and Wheatus started playing, and they played every song except Teenage Dirtbag, because they knew the moment they did, everyone would leave. Now, waiting for that song was an interesting experience. It wasn't awful, it just wasn't great. 
It was a state of, I am here and this is okay, but I know it could be better. Playing villagers and heroes feels exactly like that, except you know there is no teenage dirtbag at the end. You know they're going to pack up and leave. Playing villagers and heroes is like watching a cover version of your favourite band. Right, now I've finished all the gathering quests given to me, but I have one crafting quest remaining. Make a health potion, and I can't do it because I need peas, and I use them all on something else. So if this game is about villagers, maybe I can just grow some peas. So I go back to town and head to my village portal. You choose which village you want to join. They're all instanced areas, so I go with Valhalla, because there is one spot left. They can hold 60. The village area looks fine. This game isn't really bothered about pushing the boat out or challenging the player. It's exactly what you'd expect an average MMO to be. I stick my house in a vacant plot and then try and plant some peas in the garden. I buy some seeds, use them on the floor, and then four hours. Four hours I've got to wait for the peas. Are you taking the mick game? I have to wait four hours for them to grow. You know what? No. I'm going to water my sheep and then clip through my ephemeral fence and head on over to the harbour to take a boat over to the main city to see what that's like. The main city is fine. Like everything else in the game, it's a city, it's main, it's laid out fine. I say hi in the world chat and then Portia asks me if I'm filming an episode of Worst MMO Ever. Unfortunately, yes, Portia. Yes, I am. I decide to grind through the main quest a bit more to see if it gets any more interesting. And while doing that, let's just read some reviews for this game. If you enjoy following detailed quest lines and the ability to collect and craft, then you will really enjoy this game. US server, message me for in-game name and guild invite. Game is definitely a good one, but lacks good graphics. More, the combat system is very slow and lags when increase in player number in a map. This game is a mobile port. With that being said, I didn't find this any fun. Overall, 4 out of 10. You will grind. A lot. You will die. A lot. At about level 19, you will essentially hit the paywall. At that point, you will find it hard to progress unless you start buying things with real money. While this is not the worst MMO out there, it certainly isn't one of the best. The game is okay, but got boring rather quickly after about 15 days into it. Everything started to feel too repetitive. Why doesn't slash sit make you sit? Why do I keep standing back up? I'm not pressing anything. I'm typing slash sit, pressing enter, and just instantly bouncing up. Is this a difficult system to program? Oh, hello, badly balanced audio, I've missed you. Check out what it sounds like when you attack a scritter first. The scritter has a response sound it's programmed to make, but the response sound is not programmed to match the audio levels of the rest of the game. Their sounds in combat are balanced, but their sounds at the start are not. So far, this game's colour palette is really carrying it, and the enemy design, especially this spectral spider, is visually quite pleasing, but mechanically it's just paint by numbers the MMO. It's like someone who had never played an MMO sat down with a checklist of what needed to be in one and put it in without understanding why it needs to be there. Crafting isn't just a gathering crafting time sink designed to make you walk all over the place. It is a way to connect your character to the unique resources within each area of the world and then build a unique looking or playing character. A quest line isn't just a story on a string that pulls the character along because it happens to be there. It's an event that directly affects the character or the world the character lives in that we should feel connected to and compelled to get involved with. A combat system isn't just there to slow down the action between story beats. It is there to be part of the action and each combat encounter should feel relevant or engaging or exciting or potentially dangerous to the player in some way. Otherwise, it's just pointless filler. Every aspect of an MMO is here, it just doesn't make me feel anything. In the same way, you could have every ingredient of a decent three-course meal served to you, but each bit of food is bland and boring and you can tell there's no passion behind it. We need to get into this ghostly dome, and we're asked for a password, and we guess at Open Sesame and are told, no, the password is Bar Ram U. Now this is a reference to the classic comedy film Babe, the one about a talking pig, and this is a perfect example of reference comedy done badly, and it highlights my feelings with this game. Referencing popular culture within games is fine, but the reference has to actually relate to the situation you are in or somehow be connected to the game, and this isn't either. This is just a writer saying, oh hey, remember Babe? That was a good film. 
This quest is about accessing a ghost inside a prison. You could have referenced Ghostbusters and gone with Gatekeeper or only Zool. You could have made a pop culture reference that's related to prisons or related to ghosts or related to sci-fi or related to destroying shields. You could have said shut down every shield generator on the detention level and it still would have made slightly more sense than Bar Ram U. Here's another example of the game dropping the ball. Inside the prison is Tarquin, the dude the evil master once released, the guy that wrote the book. And Tarquin is held here by a wood spirit who demands he count every twig on every branch of every tree every day if he wants to be fed. And that's actually an awesome little setup. How do we free him? Do we overload the shield with twigs because there's so many? Do we burn down the forest to prevent the counting? Do we kill the wood spirit or do we count the sticks ourselves? No. We go and get three unrelated items and then bring them back to him. Just how like we collected three items for the seer and the rat dude earlier. A complete mechanical disconnect between story beats and gameplay that you're tying to it. You ever gone to a shop at lunchtime to buy a meal deal, but you've arrived a little bit late and all the really good sandwiches or drinks are gone, so you have to have a less good one. And I mean, it's not the worst thing ever, you're just a bit disappointed. This game is that feeling. I fight my way through an underground goblin cave that we are somehow now at. Honestly, I stopped caring about the story a while ago. And the goblin boss is here and just, look, this is what the game considers to be a punctuating mini-boss fight. Now I need to help this ghost collect ingredients for a potion, and we do that through collecting three items and bringing them back to her, because why change tradition? And finally, this dumb quest, which I have felt no personal connection to, comes to an end. We have to accuse one of the various incredibly forgettable NPCs we've met so far of being the malicious miscreant, so we go to all of them and accuse them all, and it's none of them. In true Scooby-Doo fashion, the evil dude was actually the actress all along. But it was actually someone pretending to be the actress, pretending to be the evil dude, pretending to be... And this leads us to a boss fight. Okay, finally, this is the Last Chance Saloon. The Hail Mary. You have an open arena, you have a boss monster. Now come on, please let this be challenging. Let it have ads, mechanics, action, fear, adrenaline. This is your boss that you've built up the last eight hours to. Show me what you can do. The only mechanic is run out of the red. And even if you do get caught, you don't take much damage, you just get stunned. There's no ads, no mechanical arena use, just a few attacks where the boss thrusts its crotch in your face, then dies by flopping on top of you and you stick out of its ass. What a diabolically bad boss fight. I go and hand in the quest and just feel... nothing. If you play this game, why? I'm not saying you're wrong for playing it, I just want to know why, out of all the MMORPGs, both free and paid, you've decided on this one. Why have you decided the most mediocre experience in all of mediocre land deserves your time? If this game entered a competition for world's most average game, it wouldn't even come first, because even that would make it stand out. When people tell me they're making an MMO, this is what I imagine they're making. Ask yourself, why would a new player stick with this game? Why would anyone actively choose this over anything else? This is the MMO version of a Minecraft Let's Play YouTube channel ran by someone called ElitegamerXXX666 Clan, who uploads unedited two-hour survival streams with no dialogue. This game is an amateur dramatics performance of Romeo and Juliet, where the guy playing Romeo was an extra in the bill, and the set designer once met someone who knew someone who worked with someone at the BBC. Everyone remembers their lines, and the show goes fine, it's just completely forgettable. The final score, after eight dull hours of gameplay, is given to accurate reflect how I feel. To end the review, I will award villagers and heroes microwave meal you bought from the reduced section at the end of the day because you can't be bothered to cook and you know this won't be a culinary delight but it's warm and you're hungry. Out of 10. Thank you for watching. Another massive thank you to all the supporters on Patreon and Twitch who keep the channel going. You can support from only a pound a month. Check the video description for all the links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter and our Discord. And as always, have a great day.